Okay, everybody. Uh, today, we are blessed to have uh, Derek Jensen on, and um, I, I'm going to kind of dispense with introductions because I think anybody that knows my channel will know who Derek is, and I'll put a link uh, below to a biography if anybody needs it. So let's uh, cut all the formalities and just um, get right into it. Derek, how are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, um, it's uh, been a long week and things have been happening in the world, so I'm getting a little bit fried, but anyway, um, <laughs> it is an interesting time, I have to admit, if, you, if you're keeping up with the news. Um, do, do you actually keep up with the news and everything on the media? Um, some. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, it's not systematic. So like there aren't any news sites that I, I visit regularly. It's just whatever happens to come across, come into my, to my view, then um, if it's interesting, then I'll look up more about it. Um, yeah, I, I kind of do the same, but um, a lot comes into my view. People say, <laughs> I start the morning with all the stuff that people have sent me and it takes quite a while to plow through it. and. The news is coming thick and fast, um, and it's all kind of collapsy. Um, but anyway, uh, I want to start with a subject, um, a project of yours, um, Bright Green Lies, and pick up uh, where you left off with Natural Progressive. Okay. So I thought that was really interesting. So this, um, it's a book so far, is it my understanding, the book so far with you and Lyra Keith, is that right? Yeah, um, Lyra and then also Max Wilbur. Oh, okay. And then um, I saw you collecting for uh, crowdfunding for a movie or documentary as well. Did you see, see that? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> somebody is because I actually um, pinned it on on Reddit. I got this sub on Reddit and I uh, sent people over there. But uh, yeah, somebody's collecting. Um, <laughs> is it um, in, the, in the name of the living or something like that? I can't remember. I'd have to look it up. But I, I mean, I thought it was uh, part of the project. But so. there's there's a there's a a DGR film that that some people in Deep Green Resistance have been working on for a few years, I believe, called In the Name of the Living, and that that might be what you're talking about. If it's not that, then then I don't know what it is because because that's the only film I know about right now. And I'm not actually doing that. I'm uh, that's somebody else in DGR who is has been compiling interviews and doing, doing the the the, the film stuff. Um, oh, okay. My, uh, that's interesting. My uh, medium of expression. Okay, so yeah, um, I've been kind of trolling uh, Extinction Rebellion a bit, rather shamelessly, um, and pretty much on I think what the topic of bright green lies is, is basically the greenwash. And, you know, I think what you're saying, and that's, you know, support the planet, not the, the system, and try and greenwash it and reform it. Um, is that basically the message from bright green lies? That's one of, that's one of two messages. Um, that's the primary message. The other message is, even from their own perspective, wind and solar, I mean, not only are wind and solar not good for the planet, we can talk about that in whatever ways you want, but they also, um, are not, they, they won't even run the economy. You know, the, the, um, the claim is that they can make the entire economy run on wind and solar. Not true. Um, you can't, just one great example of that is everything that everyone has, has at some point been brought by a truck. And diesel fuel is incredibly energy dense such that a truck can go 600 miles on, on one load of, on one tank full of diesel. And to go that same distance, a 60,000, a, a semi with a 60,000 pound payload would have to have about 55,000 pounds worth of, of batteries. So that makes a whole, I mean, that what thousand pound payload. So, and we can talk about it on other levels too. But yes, the primary point is it doesn't help the planet. And most of the people pushing that stuff aren't even trying to, to, 
to, to claim they're protecting the planet. They call themselves environmentalists, but they say explicitly they're trying to save this way of life. And, um, and it, it doesn't. I mean, there are increasingly conflicts between um, grassroots environmentalists around the world and those who are pushing wind and solar. Yeah, I've, I've seen all that, even in the anarchist movement, which we'll, I'll, I'll get to later. But yeah, the, um, this idea that the system can be made to pay for itself without oil um, is, is, is a fiction. Um, the, so I, I remember uh, going back um, to uh, like ancient Greece, I think it was Hero who invented the steam turbine. And, uh, you know, if you look at tech historians, they say, well, you know, we almost started the Industrial Revolution in ancient Greece, you know, 3,000 years ago. And they don't quite understand that you were never going to actually make the business case to have that steam turbine drive a vehicle. Because if you look at, uh, say, a hay wagon, then people like uh, James Scott says that, you know, you can only go, I think he said... That's about 15 miles, and the, the oxen have already eaten all the hay that you're trying to transport, which is kind of like batteries and trains. Nobody ever talks about the batteries and the trains, do they? They're like, you cannot run freight trains with batteries or long-haul um, you know, freight vehicles and stuff with batteries. You know, Once they're carrying the load of the batteries, that's, that's it. They can't actually carry any cargo. So Elon Musk with his truck is about at the limit of it. But uh, anyway, the, James Scott's argument was, yeah, you know, in that, you can't actually make a viable business case back in those days, especially when they had slaves, because metal was so expensive and basically it was a grain economy. And grain wasn't energy dense enough to make an industrial revolution. And that's why it wasn't that they weren't smart enough or they didn't have the technology. They had it. Hero had it. He demonstrated a steam turbine and he could have started the industrial revolution right there. But he didn't because, you know, basically there, there wasn't any oil. It's basically only when you get oil that then you can start, the, you know, basically fossil fuels, coal starts the Industrial Revolution. What do you think? Oh, I agree. I agree. There, there, there are, um, I think, it, it, one of the things that really frustrates me about a lot of the mainstream discussions of, of all of this renewable stuff is that they don't have a basic grounding in in science and a basic understanding and i'm not talking about having to be a phd physics to understand this stuff i'm saying that a lot of the activists who are writing about this stuff are a great example is Naomi Klein will talk about how there are cities and the Sierra Club's doing the same thing. Sierra Club is talking about this. Bill McKibben's talking about this. Lots of people are talking about this. A lot of politicians are talking about this. They're saying, so Los Angeles has promised to go 100% renewable energy and Munich has promised to go 100% renewable energy. That is, no, no. <laughs> they have pledged to go 100% renewable electricity. And electricity is only 20% of energy. Those words are not, those words aren't synonyms. 80% um, of the energy, and this is true across a lot of different countries, most industrialized not countries, about 20% of total energy use is electricity. And so when they say Munich is pledging to go 100% renewable energy, what they're really meaning is they're pledging to go 100% quote, renewable, end quote, because most of that is biomass anyway, which is just cutting down trees and burning them or growing corn and burning that. It's not, and my point here is not that particular issue. My point is that, as you just said, I mean, you have to have a, just a basic, just a tiny understanding of science to understand why they didn't have the Industrial Revolution 2,000 years ago. It's the same thing here, that if you have this basic understanding, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm presuming that on your, on your show, you, your, your viewers are very um, 
are aware of E-R-O-E-I, Energy Return on Energy Invested? Well, if they've watched my videos, they are, um, because I, um, I, I made this video on Gebekli Tepe, which is this archaeological site in, in Turkey. And um, it looks like, to me anyway, that my interpretation of the site is they started civilization the 11,600 years ago. The interesting thing is they covered it over three times, deliber deliberately over about a thousand years. And so they intrinsically saw that it was evil from, I think that's what the evidence shows, that basically they denuded the local environment to put, support this proto. It's, it's a temple complex, right? It's a very, very interesting site. Um, it's not a city. No one lived there. It's basically, I equate it to kind of like Burning Man. It's kind of like a big market, uh, basically market for sex and drugs. And basically it's the first city. It's a casino. It's Las Vegas in, in you know, um, just on the border with uh, with Syria there in southern Turkey. So it's a very, very important site. Not a lot of people know about it yet because archaeologi archaeologists are not comfortable with explaining it to the public because it overturns their whole story. Um, you know, particularly Gordon Child's theory about, you know, how civilization is a great thing and it came from grains. And then <laughs> it's like, no, it's that story is all upside down. Um, and so it, what I try to show in um, that uh, energy return on energy invested, or it's easier to just say EROI, energy return on investment, is, is that if you have a look at, look at it closely, civilization is net negative. Nobody yep. does a whole cost accounting because it's, it's just a dirty secret that it's just done from borrowing, you know, back in time. Fossil fuels are basically borrowing backwards. They're borrowing from everybody in the present. What I would use. Sorry? Stealing is what I would use, not borrowing. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> well, they, they're raiding the carbonifer carboniferous era, bringing yeah. them forward in time to the present. They're raiding every, you know, all the workers and shortchanging the environments and everybody in the present. And then they're passing on this huge package to the future generations, which is, oh, clean up all the carbon and pollution later. So it's basically a huge deficit that they're just hiding. So it's a big deficit hole. And everybody thinks, no, civilization has benefits and say, no, not if you do a proper accounting. What do you think of that? Well, I completely agree. It's... Um everything in our way of life from the house behind me to the to the to the to the boat behind you to the computers we're using this is all completely unsustainable there 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 is only one way one level of technology that's sustainable and that's the stone age and we i was riding a car with a friend of mine 30 years ago and we we're stuck in traffic and I was just making conversation. I said, so George, if you could live, live at any level of technology that you wanted, what would it be? And George was in a terrible mood. And he said, that's a really stupid question, Derek. We can fantasize whatever we want, but the truth is there's only one level of technology that's sustainable. That's the stone age. And we will be living there again someday. And the only question is what's left of the world when we get there. And you can't, to use sort of a cliche, um, Borrowing from the future, as we're doing, destroying your land base is not a plan with a future. It's a plan with zero future. And, you know, I've, I mean, this has been my entire, people act like, you know, I hate modern medicine or I hate hot showers or I hate, and it, no, I don't. It's just, I recognize that everything we have, I'm, I'm touching the computer here. This came from somewhere, and that somewhere was someone else's home. And that somewhere was harmed to make this thing. And I don't, I was gonna say, I don't understand how people can be so stupid as to not see that really basic fundamental fact that if, you, if your way of living harms the land base, even a tiny bit, if it does that over time, it's not sustainable. I, I, and, and the only way I can really understand it, you know, I've written all these books and it still don't, it still baffles me except for Upton Sinclair's line about, it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. Or it's hard to make people understand something when their entitlements depend on them not understanding it. When their, you know, their access to, 
And it's not just entitlements because we've all been made dependent on the system. It's actually access to food, clothing, and shelter at this point that we're dependent on the system. You know, Daniel Quinn and others have pointed this out too, that it's really ironic and sad that we have made ourselves dependent on a system that is killing everything. And we are dependent for our lives on it at this point, most of us. Um, but yeah, and I want to go back to the, <clears throat> to the, to the EROI thing for a second. And I want to, I want to find some, see if I can find some things from Bright Green Lives real fast that just kind of crack me up on the whole question of energy storage. Um, Actually, while, you, while you're doing that, have you um, seen anything from James Scott and the stuff that, He's a Yale um, professor, I think. Have no, I have not. So I, I would recommend if you um, if you're writing on EROI, um, he doesn't mention it really specifically. But he, if you're interested in the history and the origins of um, of civilization, then I would highly recommend um, his work. He's got a book called Against the Grain, and he he covers. I just didn't know his name. I know the book. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, well, that's, um, I think that's an invaluable source um, of, of that, of early civilization and the fact that it didn't pay for itself in, in so many ways. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I'll, I'll, you know, I, I do, I do some interviews and I'll, I'll think about interviewing them. That's a great idea. Oh, wow. I, uh, if, uh, if you get us contact information, do you mind sending it my way? Cause I, I would love to have an interview with him. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll poke around. Um, here's the thing I was going to read. It's pretty short. Um, this is from Bright Green Lies. The last couple of days, I've been having fun thinking about energy density, which, if you recall, is the amount of energy per unit mass you can store in some material. Here's what has me laughing. Bright Greens are excited because lithium-ion batteries can store one megajoule per kilogram and hope to someday reach five megajoules per kilogram. But fat already can and does and reliably will store 37 megajoules per kilogram and protein and carbohydrates are about 17 megajoules per kilogram. We think we're so smart as we destroy the world so we can make a battery with less than one third the energy density of a potato and maybe one fifteenth the energy density of bacon. Wood is about 16 megajoules per kilogram and cow chips are about 13. Yes, I know I'm comparing apples and oranges, or more accurately, apples, about three megajoules per kilogram, and batteries, one megajoule per kilogram or less. But the real point is that nature's really smart. It created these wonderful means to store and transfer energy, transfer energy called, for example, fish in the river, and we're destroying them. Water at the top of a 100-meter tall dam has an energy density of 0 0.001 megajoules per kilogram. That's one two thousandth the energy density of a salmon. Oh yeah, and a wind turbine has, uh, it's just scraping over, um, well, they, they, they fudge the estimates, but it's about 1.6 on <laughs> the ROI. It's, it's barely paying for itself. And then, you know, it, it's in a remote you know, uh, location. So the voltage drop on all the high tension cables to get it to any civilization means you, you already lost all the energy. So wind farms are never going to do it for anybody <laughs> either. But um, well, yeah, they're going to do it for the stockholders of the companies that, that build them because of the subsidies they're getting. That's the whole point of all this bright green stuff is, well, there's two points. One of them is um, capitalism is based on subsidies and um, the, the real key to making money is not to make a better product. The real key to making money is to figure out how to get subsidies for your R&D and for your, to actually, to get the government, to get the public to actually pay for the thing you're building. And that's, um, I mean, that's why, for example, China has this really strong, strong uh, solar industry is because it's been subsidized by, well, the Chinese government for one. And then also, you know, they talk about the German energy miracle, which really wasn't a miracle, that that was based on forced subsidies to the German people through tariffs on their uh, electric bills, um, which, by the way, big companies like BASF were exempt from those tariffs. So the big users didn't pay, the individuals did. And that was money that was directly sent to the, I mean, it's interesting, it's a forced, a forced subsidy, a forced tax on individuals 
which was then given to the Chinese uh, solar industry, which is where they really made their money. I mean, that's, again, that's how, that's one of the points of all this is, you know, th this is one of the things that I talk about in, in terms of, there's been this, this transformation of the environmental movement over the last 30 years. At one point, it was about protecting wild places and wild beings from this culture. And really, I mean, this, this is a longer discussion that has been going on in the environmental movement for at least since the time of Gifford Pinchot and John Muir. But it's really, really shifted in the last 30 years to now the environmental movement is about um, sustaining this way of life a bit longer as opposed to protecting wild places and wild beings. And a great example of that is if you have 100,000 people marching in the streets of New York or Paris or London or Washington, D.C., and you ask them why they're marching, they'll say, oh, we want to save the planet. But if you ask them what their demands are, their demands are for subsidies for wind and solar. And that's an extraordinary thing to convert. I can't think of other examples where you've converted, not you, but, but they have converted a mass movement into a lobbying arm for a specific sector of industrial capitalism. That's extraordinary to me. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a tremendous coup. Um, I can't think of that. You know, the, the, the anti-war protests in the 60s and 70s, I mean, they didn't, their demands were that they stopped the war. Their demands weren't that you give subsidies to the tuna fishing industry. I mean, it's just, this is just nuts. So the civil rights movement was not about let's give some subsidies to, you know, this or that industry. It's, it's, it's been an extraordinary coup. It's not, a, and, and they're very explicit that they're not about saving the planet at all. They're about saving this way of life. They're quite explicit about that. I had a, yeah. uh, an exchange with Bill McKibben, and I want to say very explicitly that I'm saying nothing bad about Bill McKibben as a person or as an activist. No one has has devoted their life more tirelessly to raising awareness of global warming. It's a difference in value that I have with him. And he, he wrote to me several years ago to say, hey, I've, I've been, I heard you were saying bad things about me behind my back. So I figured, you know, maybe just respect me enough to say them to my face, which is great. You know, that's, a, that's a very adult, mature way to handle it. And I wrote back to him and said, I'm happy to. You know, I don't say anything bad about you. It's just, I wish that you were explicit that you were trying to save the planet instead of being explicit that you're trying to save civilization. That's, that's our fundamental difference. And that's what I've said behind your back. And that's what I'll say to you too. And, and I'm happy to have these discussions with you. And it's, I mean, it, that's, that's the thing. I respect the fact that he works so hard. I respect the fact that he is very tireless and, and he's, he's simply, he's just wrong. I mean, he's, he's, his values are different than mine. And also He's wrong in that, as we were sort of alluding to, solar and wind are not going to save civilization anyway. And the problem is the believing that solar and wind are going to save the planet or this culture are, they waste time we don't have on solutions that physically won't work. So, um, yeah, it was a very sad day, I think, when Greenpeace started to in endorse nuclear. And nuclear is the thing that really scares the bejesus out of me, not because of the the kind of McPherson scaremongering about nuclear, but the, the fact that um, it, it's kind of the go-to thing where they can actually say there is um, enough energy density. I think what people missed a lot in the Bush era, if you remember back in those days, they had um, the, the hydrogen economy. It was going to be a hydrogen economy. I don't think people understood what that meant. Um, you know, I, I saw a lot of articles saying, oh, yeah, but how will it work? Where are you going to get the hydrogen from? And they say, like, that was their dirty little secret. If you actually looked into it, it was a nuclear economy. Basically, the hydrogen cells came from this uh, sulfur process that was from a nuclear, basically, an expansion of the nuclear industry. Um, so they were going to use nuclear power to generate hydrogen fuel cells that then they would distribute and then that, that would be have a high enough density. It's kind of like a bomb in your car in, in effect, putting a hydrogen cell in. And nobody understood that. They, nobody made the connection as far as I could tell in the press or anywhere that 
I, I mean, I was kind of embedded in that area somewhere. So I found that out, you know, um, through the back door, through presentations and that from actually people in the military. And so that's the only reason I made that, that connection. But the, uh, that, the, the nuclear thing scares me because that the, it's harder to make arguments against, against nuclear if people go completely Dr. Strange love and say, we're going to save this, this civilization and it's going to be nuclear. So say to nuclear. This, is, this is an honest question for you. Um, so I'm going to ask the question. And then after you answer, then I'm going to go on why I'm asking the question. What is, what is a reasonable, if you do some sort of full cost accounting, including mining, including uh, decommissioning, including um, storing the nuclear waste, what is the EROI of uh, nuclear? Well, the, pro, the, the thing is, it's very murky. There's no easy answer because uh, the uranium comes from a lot of other mines, like gold mining and a lot of peripheral things. So if you mine gold, you get uranium kind of for free. So it's, it's kind of murky, even in the metals mining thing. The uranium mines are, are deep mines. They're not open cast mines. Um, there's a lot of tailings that come, come from the mine. So the actual process of getting it together is not as dirty as, say, uh, open cast, say, coal mining. Um, but okay, once you start refining it, um, then uh, you, that's not also not a very dirty process, it's quite energy intensive. Um, but here's where it gets really murky is they don't decommission these things. So if you look at uh, Hanford and these, they, they've, you know, Yucca Mountain didn't fly. So they have no nuclear repository. So they don't account for the fact of disposal of this. They basically, they have to some way or some day um, put it back underground. And uh, since nobody will take it, uh, the, the spent fuel, it just stays on site. So they've never been called to account except when there's a disaster. And so if you look at Fukushima and you look at uh, Chernobyl, then, then that's kind of like an accounting for it. But here it gets murky too, because if you look at Fukushima and you look at Chernobyl, they actually are, if you look at the Chernobyl exclusion zone, it's actually nature coming back. This, if, oh, if, yeah. or if you, they're like 410 nuclear power stations around the world. If they all went Chernobyl, that would be great for the environment. And, and, and so it gets murkier still because the estimates for um, the radiation is not quite what we think. If you get a strong dose of radiation, it's kind of like being you know, shot with a bullet. Yeah, if, if I shoot somebody five times with a bullet, uh, you know, they probably won't survive. If I shoot them like once a year for five years, they might survive, you know. Uh, and that's kind of what the radiation is like. So the, uh, the ecosystem is recovering remarkably around Fukushima and around Chernobyl. So, yeah, it's not a clear-cut case is, is what I'm saying. If you actually do a whole cost accounting, it gets murky. But overall, I think you don't want to do it because what the what's the electricity going to be used for? And it's going to be for some ecocidal nonsense, of course. Oh, I don't disagree with that at all. I, I completely agree with you. And the reason I was asking that is because, honestly, I have not, I have pretty much out of hand dismissed nuclear as an alternative, even for those who want to keep the system going. And the reason is because when I got my degree, I, I went to the Colorado School of Mines, which is an extremely conservative, well-respected and extremely conservative earth destroying school and not much environmental concern there. Great. I mean, it's, it's an oil school and it's a, it's a, it's an energy school is what it is really. And <clears throat> My professors, when I was there, consistently, this wasn't just one kook, but most of the professors I remember who brought up nuclear at all, they were very dismissive of it on an EROI perspective. And um, I remember a couple of my physics professors saying, a couple of them, not just one, saying that from an EROI perspective, the best thing you can do 
if you build an em empty nuclear reactor and you haven't mined the uranium yet, you haven't milled or, or refined any of it yet, the best thing you can do is shut the thing down. Because when you take into account the mining, refining, um, use, which is positive, and then decommissioning and and um, protecting, and this was not from an environmental perspective. They didn't care about that. They said from, they were saying from an EROI perspective, it's, it's a losing venture when you take in, in all that other stuff into account. And because I was, you know, young and impressionable, I was 22, and because they were my college physics professors, I've always pretty much just accepted, I mean, they could have been full of crap. I don't know, but I've always sort of dismissed it because I had that early and I, it wasn't, again, they weren't arguing. This wasn't like pre-nuclear Greenpeace making a propagandistic case against it. These were sort of hard bitten engineers who were like, nah, it's a waste. And <clears throat> I've never, I probably should have, but I never have bothered to follow up and actually do the math myself. Well, um, it's difficult to do the math. And one of the reasons is, uh, you know, they keep on coming up with new innovations. So if ever you nail their feet to the floor, there's always something new coming down the pipeline. And the really dangerous thing, and it gets more and more difficult to make the old arguments, say, of profitability and stuff. So it gets uh, to the stage where now then uh, things are turning to thorium. So thorium is still, you know, pixie magic. But... They're getting close, and particularly places like India has a lot of thorium. Then it starts getting very dangerous to make uh, a green case against it or an EROI case against it. So it's, the thorium is the reason why they aren't rolling out thorium reactors um, hither and thither, although India wants to. They haven't perfected their technology. It's kind of like a huge Rube Goldberg um, apparatus uh, to actually get through thorium through the cycle um, to make it reactive. Uh, I mean, this is the running cycle, to not, not to commission the plant. They're, they're about, oh, I can't remember, they're probably about 10 or 12 stages that has to go through its very complicated mm -hmm. process to make thorium, uh, you know, fissile and reactive. So uh, back, they, they're working like crazy on thorium. Now, if you look at thorium and you say, okay, why don't we run the planet on thorium? That's a kind of hard task. I mean, because you, you have to say that it's going to destroy the, the environment, but uh, it's, uh, you get kind of laughed out of court if you, if you, you know, make the argument that it's going to hurt uh, you know, Yellowstone Park or you know, Yosemite is going to be crushed or, you know, the... Kenya is not going to have the Serengeti. It's kind of, people will say, no, that saves all of the, you know, the natural world. So, yeah, I don't know. Have you looked at thorium? No, not really. Um, and, I mean, you, you said something earlier. It's like, what are they going to use the electricity for? And um, I mean, one of the things that... that is one of the sort of elephants in the room that we really need to talk about is the world does not need more industrial energy production or energy harvesting really, because it's not really, they're not producing energy, they're harvesting energy. Whether they're harvesting energy from, as you said, millions of years ago, or harvesting it from the wind or harvesting it from the sun or harvesting it from rocks, they're, they are harvesting it. They're not, they're not actually producing anything. And does the world need that? And no, the world actually doesn't. The world doesn't. The, the world doesn't need it. The problem is they're harvesting the atom, the nucleus of the atom. And then it, the argument gets very subtle. So we have to, you know, what we're running against is, is this uh, tech, technological singularity, this rapture of the nerds. And the problem is it's very close. I mean, things uh, like fusion reactors, they also pixie dust, but they, uh, they're getting close. That, there's uh, just this week, there was a fusion reactor in the UK that was uh, fired up again, and that getting very close to net positive EROI. 
So if you have a fusion reactor, that's basically a plasma ball that uh, generates electricity. That's a very, very, you know, it's, it's criminally attractive for, you know, basically technophiles. Yeah, because, because then it's, it's almost like, oh, we got free energy, we saved. And it's like, oh my God, if, if you did all this <laughs> with, with fossil fuel energy, what the hell are you going to do with free energy? And they're like, well, we're going to do everything. We're going to go to Mars. And we're going to just like, oh my God, just shoot these people. But uh, the, the thing is that it's, it's things like fusion reaction, they think is about 20 years out. So have a look how close we are to the environmental tipping points. I think we're already passed, but I mean, even the people in the Extinction Rebellion think it's from, you know, between 2005, uh, large proportion by uh, 2030, 70% of people, according to a survey I did, uh, people in the Extinction Rebellion think it's game over. We passed all the tipping points. Activism is too late. So, but that's almost on the same time horizon as all these tech nerds for their singularity of the nerds. That's also about that time frame. So we're running neck and neck on this insane project. I don't see them as running neck and neck because I see them as really the, the destruction of the planet and that technological singularity are really the same project. I mean, that's, that's where it's been aiming from the beginning is to destroy nature and to convert it into machines. That's what that's that's the point. That's been the point from from the beginning. And by machines, I don't just mean toasters. Um, I do mean toasters, but I also mean um, you know what Lewis Mumford talked about with the mega machine, the the large social organizations that use humans as cogs in machine in that larger social social machine, um, like the corporation of Coca Cola or the corporation of ADM or the army that built the, 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 the army in quotes that built the pyramids, it's all the same thing. NASA, it's all the same thing. And, and the, 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 the question I always come down to always is what are the effects on the real world, on the, the physical world? And um, if, I agree with your implication that um, you know the worst possible thing for the world would be if one of those actually does turn out to be positive EROI and gets in place. That's the question I always ask is so what would does from from a prairie dog's perspective or a coho salmon's perspective or a blue whale's perspective or a redwood tree's perspective is this a good thing it's an absolute disaster but here's the problem economists step in and they're monetizing nature so they put a value uh, uh basically a market price on salmon and redwood so the, right. the price of a redwood is not that high. I mean, if you take natural forest and stuff, it's about $400 per hectare is the, basically the market value of a forest. So if, if you look at everything in terms of capitalism, and you look at the Serengeti in terms of how much revenue it can produce, it's uh, you know, a couple of million in tourists. And uh, that's not very high, uh, you know, compared to say, well, the elephants would pay to save it. <laughs> they would pay everything they have. <laughs> and, you know, basically it's as their, their species is at stake, uh, just like ours, and they, they, they would pay an infinite price. But you see, they are not counting for this as an infinite price because the whole cost account, oh, look, it's, it kind of boils down to, are we going extinct or not? And they say, no. If we're going extinct, then all the counting comes down to an infinite price. If you say we're not going extinct, well, then you make a forward discount value, and that's what the economists are doing. But they're crazy because this guy like Niebauer and that, he, he wins the, um, the Nobel Prize for economics for saying, oh, no, I've worked it all out. We'll park the, you know, the, 
increase in global heating at a nice little three degrees Celsius. And I've worked it all out. That's great. You know, basically everything works out. It's the, it's the best utility. It's the, you know, the Perondo maximum or whatever, the Minimax theory or whatever blasted thing he used. And then basically they, they come out and say, that's perfect for the salmon and for everybody. I mean, the salmon get devastated. But if you look overall, it kind of works out for everybody at three degrees Celsius. And then, you know, climate science is saying, we're fucking toast, excuse my language, but we are toast after two degrees Celsius. So we're going into the, all these tipping points. Economists don't accept that because it just goes against the grain of economics. Um, a couple things. One is uh, I, finished, I finished college and I had a year of eligibility left for high jumping. So I took, I came back to college for one more year and uh, the easiest thing they offered at the School of Mines was mineral economics. So I took a year of graduate economics and it was, the microeconomics I thought was pretty interesting because it's just, that was pretty basic. You know, if there's four people want to buy one candy bar, the candy bar is going to be more expensive than if you have four candy bars in one person, you know, just, that was, but when they got to the macroeconomics, even at 21 and 22 and 23, I was really frustrated by it because they would say, okay, let's presume. And then that's just one sentence of let's presume they would take off from there and go on for an entire book. But the premise, the presumption in the first place was crap. And, and they would forget that it, they'd forget they'd made the premise in the first place. They build up just premise after premise. So a lot of macroeconomics seemed like basically standing there in a field, guessing, just, it was just guessing. It was just nonsense. But the other thing I wanted to say is this whole thing about monetizing everything. I was doing a, a video talk at Yale, I think it was. Uh, several years ago, and all the people at Yale were insisting that the only way to save nature is to put a monetary value on everything. And I was disagreeing, and we were not communicating very well. I wasn't, neither one of us, neither they nor I were making any headway. And finally, I said, you know, actually, I have to apologize because you are right. And the only way to save anything is to monetize it. And in fact, that's true with humans too. And one of the people there said, yeah, of course it is. That's what insurance companies do all the time. And there's the famous line by, by Larry Summers about how uh, you wanna put more pollution in countries where the, the value of the people is less because that will cost you less when they die. And so I said, yeah, absolutely. That's the only way to do it. And um, in fact, that applies to everybody in this conversation, too. It's not just other people. It's everybody in the conversation. And so I said to one of the kids, so here's the thing is you are going to Yale. So let's presume that your lifetime earnings are going to be $4 million. And let's presume that the present value of that is $1 million. Okay, you with me? He said, yeah, as long as we make them numbers. That sounds about right. I said, well, I got good news and bad news. So I talked to your parents and uh, they agreed that I can kill you. That's the bad news for you is you're gonna die. The good news is I way overpaid because I gave your parents $7 million. And I mean, what I was trying to do, of course, is to personalize it, make it, I mean, that's all fine to say, oh, somebody's life is worth X amount, unless it's yours. Uh, so, so if I may interrupt you, so there is a stronger argument that you should have made perhaps to people that argue for monetizing nature. And that's if you say that everything is its market value, what happens when the market collapses, you morons? So, for example, they did this in Africa. You basically, they, they conservationists said, look, the only way we can save these game farms is by using you know ecotourism and safaris and so so then we have safaris we let guys come and kill Cyril the lion and stuff like that and but we get the, the revenue from them now the problem is you need the market system intact once you've made a commodity out of the Serengeti or something and the market collapses you've just said that the Serengeti has no value whatsoever Therefore, you can make bushmeat out of it 
And that's what happens. As soon as you, the, the market collapses for all these things, as soon as ecotourism collapses, which is coming, then basically you have said to the local people, to the world, to the whole industry, the whole fabric of society now values the Serengeti at zero because there's no market. It's bushmeat. That basically you've, you've just condemned all the animals in half of Africa to bushmeat. I agree with you. And, and let's, let's do another example of this too. That um, phytoplankton provides the oxygen for I think one third or one half of all animal breaths on the planet. And um, so if somebody gave you $10 trillion for all of the phytoplankton on the world, that's great. You now have $10 trillion. What are you going to breathe? It's like, it's just the whole, the whole thing is just, it's just madness. Oh, oh, don't even start on the rhinos and the rhino horn. If you put, that was the other thing that happened to the ecologists is they say, you know, okay, we will start selling rhino horn in limited quantities because you can, you know, it's worth more than gold in weight. And we can make so much, you know, if you make the devil's bargain, you can take all that money and you can expand the game reserves. What they found was the guys in China buying the rhino horn were poaching it to extinction deliberately because they had warehouses full of rhino horn. And they knew that as soon as the rhino goes extinct, they would be, have you know, in almost infinite amounts of money for this rhino horn, because everybody in China would know there's no more. It would be incalculably valuable. So they had the negative incentive of wiping out the source of their wealth, which is the rhino, to drive up the value of the, basically the commodity that they had in store. So you, you, it's not a positive incentive. The market doesn't always provide positive incentives. There are all these perverse incentives as well. I think, I think that the, the underlying thread of everything we've been talking about so far is that if you have an ungrounded economy, an ungrounded morality, an ungrounded whatever, it's going to end up insane. Literally, well, and that, that's the definition of insane is being out of touch with physical reality. And in order to have any sane economic system, it must be based in physical reality, which includes the real world. And I mean, that's, that's the thing we've been talking about various, various uh, markers, or not markers, but various symptoms of this culture's craziness. And one of the sources of these is, is this entire ungroundedness. And, and, you know, we can talk about other things too. I don't, I mean. You know, one of the things I've written about in, in a few books is that uh, a global economy is going to be inherently destructive because it is um, because nothing, not even something as, as highly populous as salmon, can survive an infinite, essentially infinite demand of a global economy. The salmon in the Pacific Northwest were in trouble before they put in the dams on the Columbia because they put in canning factories. And passenger pigeons were wiped out because of infinite demand. And cod, cod were wiped out. Yeah. Cod, yeah. everything, everything, great ox. Uh, that's why there's no penguins in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, they weren't penguin penguins, but they were the ecological equivalent, the great auk. Um, I got a note from somebody 15 years ago saying that she used to see like four or five bears every day. And then this is up in British Columbia. And then the, the local hunters uh, discovered the Chinese market for bear gallbladders. And within a couple of years, the local bear population was wiped out. And, you know, if something as esoteric as a bare gallbladder, the demand in China can destroy the population in, in part of British Columbia, that's an extraordinary indictment of any global economy. I mean, it's, it's not, something that's really frustrating to me 
and I'm not talking about this conversation, I'm talking about all conversations about these issues, is that it's almost embarrassing that you and I even have to talk about any of this stuff in the first place. Because we can use some big language, you know, energy return on energy investment and talk about full cost accounting, but none of this stuff we're talking about is cognitively challenging. It's, it's, it's extraordinary to me. And I, I, I think it's very important that we're having these conversations, but it is devastatingly horrifying to me that we even have to have them in the first place because there's, there's, the issues are so stupid. Yeah, the, well, here's the problem. As I see it, the biggest problem now is that the capitalist system has taken a large part of 7.7 .7 billion people hostage. So we've got to the point where, you know, well, all they really doing, right, is, is farming people. And that's what the capitalist system does. It commoditizes people as a resource and kind of uses them as a feedlot in that kind of labor camp, which right. I don't think is too bleak a, a characterization of how capitalism works. The problem is that because we're just cattle, they, they had no limit on how, you know, more cattle was good. There was no amount of cattle that was too much for this feedlot. So they expanded and expanded the number of people. And I'm talking about the population of Earth. So now they've got, you know, 7.7 .7 people with a gun to their head. Because if you say to anybody now, we need to basically have degrowth, or you talk anti-surf, you get to this embarrassing point where you have to say, look, killer argument, 7.7 .7 billion people, uh, some proportion, large proportion, big arguments where, but you know, even scientists will say 3.4 billion is all that agriculture can support. And these are the guys who really, really are uh, pro the system. I mean, most serious people would say it's probably around 500 million. I think the limits to growth and stuff like that is more like a sustainable. But anyway, somewhere south of a billion is probably sustainable. Yeah, it's going down every day because it's culture. I mean, I can't eat salmon anymore. 100 years ago, 200 years ago, I could have eaten salmon 50 yards that way. Can't anymore. So it's going down. The, the number that this planet can support is decreasing every single day. Yeah. But here's the problem, is they're saying that we have to have civilization now or billions are going to die. And that's an awkward place to get to. So it's not just an argument saying, well, be reasonable. It's crazy to carry on with civilization. They've got a killer argument. And it's literally a killer argument because they're saying, if you're anti surf you're pro-genocide. And then you, my take is that if you're pro surf you're pro-extinction. So it's better to you know, make this consequentialist argument to say, look, anybody that's living on civilization, anybody that needs civilization to survive, and that's a lot of people in major capital cities around the world, is they are not sustainable. If you need civilization to feed you, clothe you, and basically keep you alive, you're not viable. You're not viable. I, okay, a, a few things. One is that... Um... Obviously, I've gotten that argument thrown at me for 20 years. And one response that I have is, okay, so if you are concerned about, if your primary concern is for humans and not for pangolins or rhinos or blue whales, if your concern, primary concern is for humans, and if you agree, that this way of life cannot go on forever. Well, if you don't agree with that, then you're not dealing with reality. So I've got no, no, nothing to say to you. But if you do agree that this way of life will end someday, then if your primary concern is for the humans and instead you're, as opposed to you just saying this to get me to shut up, then what you need to do is to prepare people for the crash. You need to be a prepper if that's the case. And not just for yourself, but for other people too. You need to start doing you know making community gardens making working for local agricultural systems and that's all great um but mostly the people who say that are not actually working to make community supported agriculture what they're doing is trying to get anybody to shut up who is acknowledging 
that this way of life isn't sustainable. That's the first thing. The next thing is, if they put me in charge of everything, I would not deindustrialize overnight. I would, I would bring us to a softer landing. It would be possible. I wish, I wish that we were using this intelligence that we claim we have in order to solve the problems. That it would be really, it would be really fun. I would still be in physics if we were doing that. You know, that would be really fun to try to figure out how we can make a soft landing. You know, right now, more than, or not more than, but right now, 50% of the children who are born in the world are not actively wanted. So a real easy solution to overpopulation is give women absolute reproductive freedom. And the, the, the biggest thing they've found, the biggest thing worldwide that reduces the number of children that women have is to teach them how to read when they're little girls. Because even that level of empowerment gives them power later. And so solving overpopulation would be really easy. All we have to do is destroy the monotheistic Abrahamic religions and also the capitalist growth imperative. My point being that we can come up with all sorts of technical solutions to discrete problems, and they're still going to run into this ideology of growth and this ideology this nature-hating ideology in the first place. So, like I said, I've gotten that, oh, you're all so genocidal a lot. And at first, like I said, I had to work my way through it, but it's not, but here's another thing, is that I asked Anurata Mittal, former director of Food First, if the people of India would be better off if the global economy disappeared tomorrow. And she laughed and said, of course. She said that they've been subsistence farmers forever. And right now there are former granaries of India. And you know, you and I can have a discussion about whether granaries, even subsistence farming is sustainable, but that's not the point right now. The point right now is that there are, there are former granaries of India that now export dog food and tulips to Europe. And when you were talking about the Serengeti, I was thinking about, um, yeah, it's not worthwhile for the tourists anymore. The way it's worthwhile, Put in lima bean farms and send all those lima beans up to Germany. You know, that's, that's, that, those, that's really happening. I'm not making that up. And so if the, you know, the, I don't want to know what the number is right now. It's pretty close to half. Let's say 40% of humans don't have access to electricity right now around the world. If the grid goes down, they're not harmed. The ones who are harmed are those of us who rely on electricity. And another part of this, then after I asked, uh, I asked, it's like, well, we still have the people who live in Mumbai, you know, the people in the slums of Mumbai. What about them? So I asked Vandana Shiva what she thought about that. And she said, no, no, no. You get rid of the global economy. They would, they would probably be okay pretty quickly because why are they in the slums? They're in the slums because their land was stolen by Coca-Cola or by Nestle or by... So they're not in the slums because they want to live in the slums. So my point is... And yes, don't get me wrong. There are more people on the planet can support. Way more people. And the technology is way overblown to be able to be supported. And that doesn't alter the fact that if we weren't running up against this uh what's the word for when you have a religion that relies on reaching heaven uh teleology or uh, millennialism it is millennial millennia, millenarianism isn't it yeah okay let's presume that's what the word means i don't remember right now but that's a tech technotopian millenarianism and if we If we recognize that that is the fantasy that it is, see, it just, it just really gets me because there is no distinction between long-term anthropocentrism and biocentrism because ultimately what is good for the planet is what is good for humans. And what is bad for the planet is, 
is ultimately bad for humans. In the short term, we get all sorts of goodies. We get, we get you know, access to ice cream 24 seven. Um, but. Well, I mean, isn't, isn't the whole subtext underneath all this that we're trying to reach escape from nature? There's, there's some part of our psyche that doesn't like nature and it's all full of death and it's all creaturely and, uh, uh, you know, civilized people are scared of nature. It's a jungle, uh, what I would call a rainforest, they call it a jungle, and they're scared of it. And they would like to uh, achieve ultimate independence from nature. And that's, I think, people like you and me think is impossible. But it isn't, it's a crazy idea that they have that they can actually lift themselves up, you know, kind of Baron von Munchausen style, lift themselves up by their own hair out of the mud of nature. You say, no, we are part and parcel of the mud of nature. You cannot do it. It's an impossible thing. You're trying to do something akin to make a perpetual motion machine or, you know, defy the second law of thermodynamics or something like that. It's a fundamental uh, impossibility they're trying to do, but you can't convince anybody of that because they're crazy. I completely agree, and you've gotten to the core of it. At the, at the core of this is a a fear and hatred of nature. And um, it, that, isn't it what you said? It was it's basically people are scared of being eaten by a bear. I heard you say in uh, Natural Progressive um, that. You know, basically, they don't want to be integrated. It's kind of like, I kind of feel that, you know, it's it's not a great crime to eat meat. As long as you realize that you're meat and you give over your meat to a bear someday. <laughs> Completely agree. I'm horrified that, I mean, that's just the final screw you to the planet that we, you know, put embalming fluid in ourselves and and make it so we're not food for anybody. And I completely agree that today, today I eat somebody and tomorrow somebody's going to eat me. And, and that's life. And well, you know, the, the insight I just had when you said that, which really is the, the, the killer for, for this argument, is that what people don't realize when you get buried, if you get buried in the ground in a grave and you get eaten by worms, they don't come from the outside. They come from the inside. <laughs> we are basically just packets for, you know, bionome. Uh, so, you know, we are integrated. Basically, we kind of like vehicles for, our, you know, the, the biome in our gut to walk around. So, uh, you know, you can't escape nature. We are, it's inside us. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, I completely agree. And there's... there's um there are bacteria inside of you who are just waiting for you to die. And then when you die, they're going to, that's when that ba those particular types of bacteria just kick in and start consuming you. That's, that's their job. Yeah. And so how do you escape nature? It's like, you cannot. <laughs> well, that's part of the problem is that we, we, you know, there's the, the, what's it called? The, uh, the great chain of being where, God is up here and soil is at the bottom. You have God, angels, men, women. Uh, well, no, you gotta, you have different ethnical flavors. You gotta have the sons of ham somewhere under women. <laughs> and you have, and you have the, the, by the way, the kings are above the merchants. And then, you know, you, you anyway, the, the point is eventually you get to animals, then you get to plants, then you get to precious gems, then sand and soil or something. And the point is that those at the bottom are, and this is their language for it, are imperfect. They are matter. Those at the top are pure mind. And that's one of the problems with, for example, science is it has. Uh, mind it is, over matter. It's all about mind over matter. That's what science is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's 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 two-ish so i'm gonna need to go in a few minutes so do you want some sort of wind down and then we can yeah we, we better sorry i i ran over a bit but we just getting into the meat of meat and potatoes <laughs> i feel like we could go on for many hours on this but well, let's, uh, let's do another we, one we do another one will, will you do another one oh of course i'd be happy to okay well um 
we can round it off pretty quick and uh, just say th from my point of view is thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, it's, uh, you know, you have real celebrity status and um, you have been saying stuff that people I think are starting to hear more and more. So it's, it's just an invaluable opportunity to just spread more of what you're saying on my humble channel. Well, thank you for saying that, and, and thank you for, for your own work in spreading sanity wherever you can. Yeah, they say, you know, people go mad in crowds, and they get sane one by one. So, you know, oh. <laughs> just drop by drop, we might get somewhere. Okay, that sounds great. So, um, yeah, just contact, contact me again, and we'll set up another time in a month or so. Great. Thanks, Derek. Thanks so much. Okay.